By the early 1960s, computers were revolutionising the world of data processing. But it was a technology in its infancy, and speed was a big issue. Performing the discrete Fourier transform on even the most basic of everyday signals was computationally prohibitive. This limitation posed a significant challenge for scientists and engineers who needed to analyse signals efficiently. It was this problem that motivated Cooley and Tukey to develop the Fast Fourier Transform, a groundbreaking algorithm that made the DFT practical, not only for the computers of their time, but with the ever-growing complexity of the datasets to be analysed, a necessity for modern-day signal processing as well. To truly appreciate the brilliance of their work, we first need to explore just how demanding the DFT is to compute and how efficient the FFT is in comparison. Let's look at how we would calculate the DFT for this signal here, containing a mere 8 samples. Here's the DFT equation. Let's rewrite it in its polar form and split the calculation into two sums, one for the real or cosine component and the other for the imaginary or sine component. In our case, n equals 8, so we need to multiply the 8 points of the signal by the 8 corresponding points on a cosine and sine wave at 8 different frequencies, like this. Here are all the samples being multiplied by a cosine wave at each frequency, and here are all the samples being multiplied by a sine wave at each frequency. And here is the sum of each column, giving the real and imaginary parts of the output of the DFT for each frequency. That's a massive 64 complex multiply and add operations for only 8 samples. The FFT, on the other hand, can do this in a mere 24 complex multiply and add operations. That's less than half as many operations. As the signal gets larger, this saving becomes even greater. How does the FFT do this? Well, if you look carefully at the table, you'll notice that certain calculations repeat themselves at different frequencies, and there's also a symmetry between some of the results. Let's take a closer look and try to understand why this is. On this graph, I've marked samples 0 and 4 on the cosine wave, which correspond to samples x0 and x4 on the signal. As the frequency of the cosine wave increases, notice how the amplitudes of the points I marked return to their original values every 2 Hz. If this is true, then when we multiply x0 and x4 by their corresponding points on the cosine wave, it doesn't matter which of the four frequencies we test, the answer will always be the same. The same thing happens if we replace the cosine wave with a sine wave. This phenomenon of repeating amplitudes is true for other sample combinations as well, the only difference being the number of frequencies for which the same amplitudes repeat. For example, samples 3 and 7 repeat only twice out of the 8 test frequencies. The same is true for the sine wave as well. Even for the frequencies where the calculations do not repeat exactly, there is often still a symmetry, such as when the values at two different frequencies are mirrored in the x-axis, like this. So as the frequency increases in the FFT, certain calculations start to repeat themselves due to the symmetry of the sine and cosine waves. By remembering the result of a calculation at one frequency, the algorithm takes advantage of this symmetry by reusing the result again when the same calculation reoccurs at another frequency, in some cases even multiplying it by minus 1 to further exploit the reflective symmetry. This saves a lot of work, making the FFT a lot more efficient. Now, there's a bit of a caveat here. This symmetry only occurs when the samples align at certain points along the sine and cosine waves. This happens when the total number of samples is a power of 2, which is crucial for the FFT to work efficiently. Therefore, the number of samples in your signal must be a power of 2. This is why my example used 8 samples. 8 is 2 cubed. So how did Cooley and Tukey exploit this repetition to make an efficient algorithm? How do they break the problem apart, perform the calculations they had to, reuse the results where they could, and stitch it all together again in one seamless solution? 
The answer is Gauss's divide and conquer method. But how does it work? And how did Kuli and Tuki adapt this method for the Fourier transform?